So are you ready to start? You got it all good? Yeah, all good. All right. Well, good day to our viewers and thank you for attending today's webinar. Today we're going to discuss endodontics and uh, more specifically endodontic irrigation. Uh, I am going to switch batteries because my battery is going out again. So we have everyone muted right now to minimize distraction, but we're encouraged, but we encourage everyone to ask questions. We have uh, the chat button and the Q&A, and we want to keep this conversational, educational, and useful. So after this program, you understand the objectives of endodontic irrigation. And I think really hopefully take away some tips that make your next endodontic procedure easier and more predictable. Um, if you aren't doing endodontic procedures, this will provide some encouragement, I hope, for you to do so. So I am um, joined by two gentlemen, Dr. Uh, Mr. Nick Pond and Mr. John Baton. So let me introduce, introduce these guys. And um, you know what I'm doing is I'm just trying to make sure that my computer doesn't go out because uh, I was plugged in and I just got a warning that it may go out again. So well, as MC, I'm going to make sure you take the time to plug it in. Yeah, no. So. I will tell you, uh, you guys, how about you guys do the intro and then I'll just make sure I'm plugged in. All I'm, right, perfect. Nick, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. So uh, like Dr. Mike was mentioning, we want to keep uh, you guys engaged throughout this. Um, with that said, we'll be doing some polls throughout the duration of the webinar just to get your, your feedback uh, and try to get uh, everybody engaged and asking questions. Uh, with that said, uh, I think we'll take this time just to get to know the audience a little bit. So uh, I'd like to start by just sending this uh, first poll out uh, just to understand, you know, how many of you out there watching are general practitioners uh, versus endodontists? Uh, and we'll see those results come in. Cool. Well, while we're doing that, do you want to just tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. Yeah. So I'm the senior product manager at Vista uh, Dental and Apex Dental Materials. Uh, really, you know, my job is focused on bringing innovative new products uh, to the market. Um, over the past uh, several years, uh, you know, I've, I've been responsible for bringing several interesting products to market from uh, the commercial standpoint, uh, primarily focusing on endodontic irrigation products. Um, and really just driven by, you know, a passion for innovation, uh, quality of product, making, you know, high quality products uh, that really improve outcomes available um, to, to everybody with, with the ultimate intent of just uh, improving oral health. That sounds good. Hey, why don't we see what that, uh, I'm good now, guys, sorry. My, uh, talk, talk Talking about endodontics, my computer was plugged in, but there was like a millimeter that I guess was sticking out, so it wasn't totally engaged, so I'm all good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, let's see what that survey says. Can we see the... the... So it, it looks like we've got a pretty even split. It's 53% general practitioners, 38% endodontists, and 10% other. All right, cool. Well, that's great. Um, you know, I'll, I'll do... Uh, uh, John's introduction. So John is the director of R&D at Vista and Apex Dental Materials. And uh, we we're um, talking about this. Uh, maybe you heard us before we started the program officially, but he's got a, a great list of uh, accomplishments behind him. So he's got a BS in biomedical engineering from Milwaukee School of Engineering, a master's in engineering from Duke University, is a former, Ful former Fulbright scholar, and then prior to joining VISTA, uh, Mr. Baton held research appointments at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, Harvard Medical School, Technical University of Munich, and UC San Diego. Uh, Mr. Baton currently holds several patents, has published numerous scientific uh, manuscripts, book chapters, and has lectured internationally on biomedical um, optics medical engineering and dental technology. So uh, John, you, you've done a lot in your day. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. You know, it's interesting. One of the things that you don't really expect when you go into the kind of the biomedical engineering field is to go into the dental world. And I can tell you, I knew nothing about dentistry. What I really like about dentistry is exactly that, is that it's really kind of ripe with an area of innovation. 
one of the coolest things that we get to do is that after making a product almost immediately, and this is kind of the cool thing here is we get that direct touch point with the customer way faster than anything I ever saw out in the medical world. So I'm delighted to be in dentistry. And so thank you for having me. And I'm excited to talk about endodontic irrigation today. Yeah, no, it's, it's an honor to have both of you on the program today. And I, I'm uh, Dr. Michael Miyasaki, and I'm a GP who's now practiced for a little over 33 years. And yes, I do do endo, and sometimes I do refer, which is kind of a luxury of being a GP. And I, I appreciate and respect my endodontic colleagues, so I'm glad we have uh, so many on the program today. And um, yeah, remember, we want this to be interactive. So I know we've got a chat button on the bottom of the Zoom. We have a Q&A button. Uh, Q&A will probably be fine, but please ask questions as we go through this presentation to be sure that, uh, you know, again, you leave with the information that you wanted. Uh, I, I was, uh, again, talking, I wanted to kind of set the tone, I guess, why we're doing this webinar, and that is, today I went on the AAE website, the American Academy of Endodontists website, and on their website, they say that annually there's about 25 million root canals done, which they see on the websites about 41,000 root canal procedures done per day, and I guess I'd never really thought about the magnitude of... Uh, the number of root canal or endodont procedures that are done per day. And of those though, about 68% are done by GPs, about 26% by the endodontist, and the remainder by other specialists. So, uh, you know, again, predominantly the root canals are done by uh, the GPs. So I think that that's just kind of interesting, um, an interesting note. And um, I don't know, uh, Nick, did you wanna, should we do the, a poll and see how many do? Yeah, sure. Um, with that said, I'd just like to, I'll send this poll out. This is asking uh, just how many root canal procedures are you guys performing um, per month? Just give you guys a few seconds to buzz in on this. Yeah, it's kind of, kind of interesting. I was, uh, I was saying post-COVID, we're doing quite a few root canals, unfortunately. <laughs> I would say as a GP, I've probably done more root canals as a proportion to uh, other sort of work, more root canals and implants um, than I probably did pre-COVID. All right. So what, what are we looking, I'm gonna look to the side, the side screen. So one to three, 17%, four to six, 17%, and 13 plus makes up yeah. 43%. All right, well, we probably have a large, again, we have a large uh, percentage of endodontists. So it's, um, they're probably doing a lot of them out there. I've been referring a lot out too. So the, um, you know, one of the things about being a GP is uh, root canals and, and uh, I know I was telling the guys here that I was reading an article, it was written in 2017, it was in Compendium by Linda Levin and she stated that many of us are kind of dependent on what she called philodontics, which I think kind of put it well. That's kind of how I was taught to do root canals uh, 30 years ago. And it was interesting because, um, you know, I talked to a lot of practitioners and sometimes they, they wonder why they don't do root canals or for the GPs or why they don't feel more comfortable. And in that article, they did a survey of educators, instructors in the dental schools and 89% of the faculty thought that the students, when they left dental school, were not competent to perform a molar root canal. I think, um, you know, that kind of sets up a barrier why more of us don't do this. And yet, um, in clinician's report uh, from Goran Christensen, he said that, again, out of 1,276 subscribers, 60% of GPs do root canals. 23% of them do them occasionally, which is similar to the, what we're seeing here. 17% uh, always refer, but that in a typical GP practice, and endodont procedures make up about 20% of their income. So especially again, after this post COVID, I think it would be advantageous if the clinician felt comfortable doing a root canal to know how to do it the best way they could so they could get the predictability. So um, I know gentlemen, you, you guys are dealing with our colleagues kind of on a, a different level. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I would just say one of the things that's kind of tough, I mean, obviously we don't get to see the clinical challenges every day, but for those that don't have a microscope, I would say doing a molar is, is probably very difficult, right? Uh, I was talking to Steve Buchanan and he just recently he said that, yeah, he did it in the past before microscopes were really prevalent, 
but it, you know, it's an art. It's very difficult. So I would say that's still one of probably the biggest challenges for a GP to do a molar case is to try to do it and find the access. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but, you know, I would say, you know, and I would have to ask you a little bit too, is, is it possible? How, how comfortable are you with loops to do an anterior case and, and so on and so forth? Yeah, I, I, to, to go on that, I think another one of the biggest challenges and why people don't feel comfortable um, doing endo is, especially when it comes to the irrigation uh, portion of, of the treatment, is that there's a lot of variability. So am I using the right um, medicaments to cleanse the canal? I mean, you can't really see necessarily that you're doing a thorough job, thorough job of, of debriding and disinfecting the root canal system. Uh, so you really need to understand the protocols, having an effective protocol and using uh, the best products available, I think, uh, in a simple uh, fashion. And, you know, sometimes it's, you know, am I using the right irrigants? Am I using the right volume in the right sequence? And I think that'll lead us into the next poll. I just want to understand, you know, and show you guys that there's a lot of people using certain irrigants uh, and maybe it's not what you're using. Um, so I'll launch that now. All right. All right, so we got another poll going. So check the irrigants that are currently part of your protocol. Multiple choice, all right, I like those. Sodium hypochlorite. So you have a chloride, Clorox, EDTA, chlorhexidine, EDTA gel, like RC prep, water, or other. Yeah, you know, as everyone's kind of answering that polling question, it is funny. I, um, I've gone out and done lectures on endodontics and kind of did, have done similar surveys. And I tell you, it's all across the board. And having learned how to do endodontics 30 years ago, it was all you know, boy, we were taught sodium hypochlorite, but things have uh, kind of progressed since then. It'd be interesting to see what the survey shows. Yeah, and I think the other major difficulty here, kind of Nick touched on it, is really kind of what's the sequence? So, you know, I think Dr. Baumgartner probably did one of the most amazing things, which said, hey, you really do have to do sodium hypo, then back to EDTA. And so, you know, there's a lot of confusion then back possibly in multiple sequences to adequately clean I think that's part of what we'll talk about a little bit too, is just standardizing the irrigation, adding enhanced irrigants so there's not so much uh, difficulty and really trying to improve overall just the irrigation procedure. Yeah. So let's see what the survey says. I'm just gonna look over the side. Uh, sodium hypochlorite, 36%. Sodium hypochlorite over the counter, like Clorox, 72%. Um, EDTA, 81%. Chlorhexine, 33%. EDTA, like RC Prep. 53, water 14, and other 17. So, yeah, you know, a lot of you using sodium hypochlorite in ET EDTA, that's pretty good. And I think as we see here, there's a lot of Clorox users. And um, when I was uh, learning how to do root canals, yeah, I was told just grab a bottle of Clorox and get in there. So, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit more too. Um, I think, um, you know, really quick, just to set the stage, and then we're going to pick these guys' brains because they really know it from the inside out. So we as clinicians kind of have a, a good idea of what the clinical challenges are, but I think it's really interesting when we have a chance to talk to the guys that are working on the products and developing the products um, to really understand what they're trying to achieve. And I think it's going to be, today's going to be really good. It's going to be both ways. You know, if you ask questions, um, you'll be able to have a deeper understanding of how to use the products properly, like John was talking about. And uh, you might bring up some points that kind of uh, illuminate them and give them some great ideas. So there, there's, we want a good exchange going on today. That's, it'll be good if we have that. Um, so endodontics, uh, yeah, I, I took Steve Buchanan's course, it was 1994. And that again, really opened my eyes to what maybe I didn't pick up when I was in dental school. Not that I wasn't taught right in dental school, but maybe in that dental school mind just didn't appreciate all the little nuances. Um, but a lot of the research has shown, and again, I'll, um, talk to uh, John and Nick about this is that we get in there, we instrument and we get in there with the files and we think we're doing a pretty good job, but there's a lot of anastomosis and lateral canals that our instruments really cannot get into. And I think that's really the, uh, the objective of using good irrigants in the proper sequence like John was talking about so we can get all that bacteria out and really get the predictability of our root canals to, uh, to climb. 
So um, I will turn it over to you. I'm just gonna make one more statement that from a GP standpoint, I think if you, if a GP can feel comfortable doing root canals, and it's kind of that super generalist mindset that you offer your patients a lot of different services. Um, patients prefer, I think, to stay with us if we can manage the case right. But again, as I mentioned before, uh, if there's a case that we can't get to in time or that we don't feel comfortable managing, I would, I would always uh, refer and I would never hesitate to refer. We referred some of our patients out today. But if we can do it in our office, I think our patients really appreciate the convenience. And as I mentioned before, productivity-wise, I had patients uh, last week and this week where they came in with teeth that were badly decayed. We got in there, we did the root canal, we did their post-core, and we have a CEREC, so we actually fabricated the crown all in one appointment. And from a convenience uh, point, the patients really appreciate that. So I just want to kind of set the stage of why some of you, why I think there is value in learning how to do root canals and you know feel comfortable doing them right. So why don't we start off, let's jump into irrigation now. You know, why is it important? And um, I'll turn that over to you guys. What? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of, a lot so I, us, think, we I think it. Nick's gonna show kind of an awesome image, but for any of you that don't know, Dr. Ove Peters out of University of Pacific, after micro CT was kind of out there, he's done a great job of showing what actually is touched by an instrument and what's left behind in the canal. And that's really, you know, based on several things, you kind of touched on it, but the canal anatomy is complex, right? And more often, right, a file is ovular in, or not, sorry, not ovular in shape, but round in shape, and you've got ovular canals. So there's a lot of area that's left on the side that's not touched. So Nick, you can talk about it here, but this is a great image to really show what's left. Yeah, like Dr. Mike and, and John were saying, you know, files are straight line instruments, and there's all these lateral, uh, areas uh, and portion of the root canal system that are that are untouched that uh, your medicaments uh, don't penetrate into. So we'll, we'll talk about some ways in this presentation um, that you can, you know, enhance the penetration of your irrigants into uh, the root canal, uh, as well as here's another image just showing some really um, difficult anatomy and really the intricacy of of the root canal system. Yeah, that, that's a great picture. So, um, yeah, the, you know, the endodontists are getting excited about that, saying, yeah, look at that. And the, G, <laughs> the GPs were looking at that like, that's why what I don't do more. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. So if, if we can't get into all those canals, that, that, I guess, is the importance of irrigation, right? You got it. Exactly. It's actually pretty interesting that more recently, right, irrigation has become kind of a focal point. What was kind of cool coming into Vista and, and starting here was that we were always focused on irrigation. We, we really didn't play in the, you know, instrumentation side of things. And that was because it was kind of dominated. We saw kind of an opportunity to really become the market leader in irrigation. And we really did that because we saw this type of application where there's no way instruments are going to be able to do all that. So we really started talking to Dr. Hapasalo, and this is about 12 years ago or so when we started really enhancing, maybe 15 years ago, enhancing irrigants. And that's exactly due to this, is that you leave so much behind and you have to have things that are optimized. And we always kind of like to call it like your standard or your gold standard irrigants on steroids to really give you that added benefit. Uh, Nick also will probably talk a little bit about this, but as instruments got better, um, Nick, do you want to kind of cover this? I think this is like a great thing that you always like to kind of talk about. Yeah, sure, sure. You know, as file systems got better and better, uh, there became less contact time with sodium hypochlorite. So uh, in the past, when you were pre uh, passing an instrument, you'd always be irrigating, and there was a, a really a high amount of contact time, which is very important when it comes to tissue dissolution uh, and canal disinfection. Um, so as, you know, you know, with advances in nickel titanium instruments, uh, now you pass two or three instruments uh, to shape and clean a canal. Uh, so there's less contact time. And with that, uh, it's very important to use solutions that offer enhanced results. Um, John was mentioning, you know, products that we developed with uh, Dr. Marcus Hapasalo. Uh, to do just that, to, uh, such as Core Extra, um, which is a product with a lowered surface tension. So it contains surfactant, 
Uh, so compared to standard bleach, which pretty much all of you guys um, are using currently, uh, you'll see here that it just really wets out into the tubules uh, and carries, uh, you know, disinfects and debrides uh, the, the, all of the uh, um, lateral anatomy much, much better than standard bleach. Yeah, so I, the idea here, right, is yeah, you have a wet canal, you're hoping that these irrigants are still gonna penetrate and kind of go everywhere. The reality is it's not really like that, right? Your dental tubules are 20 microns. You really need something that's gonna be able to, to penetrate and continue to go down and wick into the tooth and really provide that. So one, yes, there's gross debridement, which is very important. That's something that any sodium hypochlorite can do but it's only when you enhance the sodium hypochlorite that you get that additional ability for the penetration and wet ability to really wick out throughout the canal and get into that tough area. And that's what this is really demonstrating. Hmm. Yeah, that's a pretty cool video watching that. So um, it, it's wicking into those lateral canals and then, then kind of acting in there and dissolving all the, uh, the uh, tissue out of those canals that we can't actively instrument. Exactly, yeah, great point. So, um, and then I don't know if, if this is the right time to get into it, but there is activation that you can throw in with this too? Uh, yeah, definitely. So um, without activation, uh, those lateral, the lateral anatomy is really untouched. So you need some sort of energy to be introduced to the root canal system to propel the irrigants into all those hard to reach areas. Um, you can kind of think of, I think this is, let me pull up a slide here. Yeah, I, I, I know probably a lot of endodonts are using it. I'm not sure about how many GPs are using it, but I really got into using activation, uh, something that Dr. Carlos Ramos taught me a lot about. And, uh, you know, that and the volume of irrigant you're using in proportion to the tissue that is inside the tooth, um, I think are important. Um, but yeah, this activation, like when I get in there and I'm doing a root canal, I'll, I'll sit there and I'll irrigate it out the canal out, I, I believe thoroughly, but when you get that activation in there, then I really feel like I'm, you know, even with the surfactants, like we're seeing with this Chlorextra, I'm really feel like I'm pumping that uh, uh, into yeah, the so lateral that's, canals. That's, that's all, that's an awesome thing to kind of park on. So, you know, roughly speaking, a canal is about 200 microliters. And if anybody can kind of understand what that is, it's, it's not much, right? It's, it's a couple of drops that fills up the root canal system. And when there's a lot of organic tissue left behind, your bleach is almost instantly inactivated. So this idea of continuous volume and exchange and then offered by and assisted by activation really is what's cleaning the canal. But it's exactly that, Dr. Miyasaki. You really need to have an adequate volume of irrigant that you're using and then activation is that last kind of key to get it over the hump. But that's the hard thing for a lot of people is that idea of, well, how much do I use? And you talk the endo, and I'm sure the endodontist and I are like, I go through bleach like crazy, right? You really need yeah. to be doing a lot of irrigant flow because it's so quickly inactivated by that organic tissue. And I think it's also important that we talk about smear layer. Um, so after instrumentation, all the tubules, uh, you know, are plugged up with dented mud, uh, and you can't get your disinfecting solutions in there. So you need something, a chelating agent, to really remove that layer so that you can go back with your sodium hypochlorite based product and uh, an activation and really thoroughly uh, cleanse. Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting like uh, John was saying that VISTA, the mission is really to kind of simplify this whole procedure of irrigation to make it more predictable and, and um, I think outperform. So we saw in the survey that a lot of doctors are just using for the sodium hypochlorite Clorox. Um, what would you say to the docs that are using Clorox compared to some of the, uh, I guess, more regulated and controlled sodium hypochlorite solutions that Vista has? Sure. You want to go on this one, Nick, or I can weigh in as well? Yeah, you can go ahead. So the hardest part, right, is that you really don't know what you're getting. So, of course, Clorox, you know, market leader in bleach, whiten your whites, so on and so forth. Well, to whiten your whites, and as anybody knows, you get one drop on it, and it's going to bleach your clothes, right? That doesn't really mean that you have an adequate amount of sodium hypochlorite to dissolve tissue. And what's really interesting is that you really need to be above 25 
to do adequate tissue dissolution. So one of the biggest problems is that you don't know how long it's been in the store, you don't know what its activity is, and so you really, at that point, you don't really know, am I doing a good job removing the organic tissue? That to me is kind of that, okay, you know, I'm not quite sure. And, and you really don't want to be left alone, kind of, am, am I sure with that? A small amount of sodium hypochlorite, you know, 200 parts per million, 300 parts per million can kill bacteria, but you really need a, a concentration that's controlled to make sure that you're removing organic tissue, to get rid of the pulp tissue, as well as biofilm. So that's the hardest part when you're buying that, bro that product right out of the, you know, the store. Hey guys, we, we had a question come in. Um, please compare the ultrasonic activator you offer to the Eddy activator. Uh, so it, uh, Eddy is a product from VDW, I believe. It's a sonic right. uh, activation tip. I don't have anything that I can show you that compares the Eddy tip, but I can show you something similar like the endo activator. Uh, we have a really great video that shows a comparison of those two. Yeah, and that's that's a great, great kind of thing to bring up. I know that a lot of people like the Eddy. Um, one of the hard things that I always think about the Eddy is that you do have to go and kind of dedicate an air-driven handpiece. I don't know how many people out there are going to have that specific handpiece so that you can add on the Eddy. I do like kind of the idea that it's plastic and non-cutting, but as we talk about a little bit further, um, the only way you can actually get cavitation in the root canal is to be in the ultrasonic frequencies. So the biggest problem I would say with an eddy type product is yes, you're moving now instead at like 2, 2K Hertz, we're at 40. So we're, you know, another 20 times the speed. And that's really important. You need that because as Dr. Vandersloos proved, when you have the small confined space of the root canal, you can't actually cause cavitation without small movement at high speed. So there's actually a theoretical limit. And so that's the one thing where we'll talk a lot about um, is that you really need ultrasonics. Ultrasonics are proven to be able to give you that cavitation. And Nick's going to show you a great reason why. Yeah, this is, this is a great video. This is a sonic device endo activator and definitely better than... Uh, then passive uh, needle irrigation. Uh, let's see, is my video gonna work? Uh, but nowhere near as, as powerful as, uh, let's see if I can get this to go here. Sorry about that. Okay. Let me try to pull that up while you guys Talk. Yeah, you, you know, it's one of those, um, you know, you put the fluid down, I think, into the canals. And, and you know, I know our endodontic colleagues um, are probably all doing this. But from a GP's perspective, you know, a lot of us were taught to uh, syringe the irrigant down into the canal. And a lot of times if there's air down the bottom of the canal, we're not going to be able to uh, get our sodium hypochlorite to get down to the apical region. And being able to use an activator like this kind of draws that fluid. And John, you can describe it probably better than I, but when you're using the, the endo activator, that's kind of not only sending the power out into lateral canals, but it helps to draw the material down into the apical region, doesn't it? Yeah, correct. So, I mean, there, it, it is true. Vapor lock is a, is a difficult thing. I mean, we'll talk probably a little bit about something like negative pressure, which is nice that can kind of alleviate that issue. But unfortunately, you're still not activating. So vapor lock really is a problem. Next, next video, hopefully we're able to get that up. What you end up seeing is that it's very difficult to get fluid movement down at the apical third, right? And that's ultimately what is the most challenging stubborn area of any root canal procedure is cleaning that apical third. And that's really what ultrasonics is gonna show you. You're gonna get exchange of irrigant. So think about it that way. Not only do you wanna get the irrigant down there, but you wanna be able to replenish. Right? We need to constantly get and flush it down there, and that's what the ultrasonics is doing. That's what you'll see in the Endo Ultra, and that's really what drives it apart from any other activator that's out there. Uh, you really do need the ultrasonics, and then we'll talk maybe a little bit more about Endo Ultra a little bit later on. But it was specifically designed for this exact application, which isn't something you're going to get from a standard piezo. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you can show it or not, Nick, but this I think does yeah. a great job. Instantly, you see the exchange this is done in just a, a simulated canal block. We put the dye down there and we've capped it. So 
This isn't open to the atmosphere. The, the apical third and the apex, the terminus there is sealed uh, with glue. And then we have other dime, like what we have is a simulated lateral canal. And you see instantly you're able to exchange that liquid. Uh, when you compare that to something like sonic activation, you're not able to do that. It really does not do that. I don't know if you have the comparison, uh, but that's something that you would see kind of with like a, an eddy style, even though it is going faster, it's still not able to really do that because it can't cause cavitation. Yeah, I wasn't able to pull up the sonic uh, version in the canal block, but you can see in this video, this is a demonstration. What you saw was the sonic uh, tip and this is the endo ultra. And like John was saying, there's a lot of options out there for activation. Um, the nice thing I think about ours is that it doesn't require uh, an investment in a piezo, a, a large piezo unit, um, and it or pips or like a laser or something like that. Um, so I think that's really the benefit there. Yeah, I really like the size and the the um, I guess the mobility of the endo activator. It's just very easy to use and get into the canals. Yeah, so we do have have an endo ultra here, just for people that have a good reference on yeah, what the product does. Um, there's also a nice light too, just to help you guide the the file that we have in here to get into the canal. But you know, a nice nice platform. You don't have to for anybody that's an endo on the line you're gonna have a piezo anyways, right? You're using it for access or post removal, but you don't have to dedicate a handpiece. That's typically what you're doing if you're gonna have something like an irisate or whatever to get into the canal. This you have, it's, it's portable, it's nice, it's nice footprint. Um, and so you're not tying up your, or your ultrasonic unit during the procedure as well. From a, G, a GP standpoint, you're probably not gonna go and invest unless you have it on your cart uh, or doing a lot of endodontic procedures, but this gives you that convenience. Yeah, yeah, it works really, really nice. Um, so as we go through debridement, um, do you both want to talk about, so we have inorganic, we've got the organic matter, we've got the pulp tissue, we've got the smear layer, as Nick was talking about. Do you guys want to go through some of that? How do we clean all that stuff out? Sure, take it away, Nick. Sure. I mean, uh, for debridement, uh, obviously it's sodium hypochlorite based product. We went over the differences between over the counter bleach versus, uh, you know, a dental indicated bleach. Uh, you, you, you also saw Chlor Extra, which is an enhanced uh, solution for debridement. So that contains surfactants. It works much faster. It's thinner. It's, it penetrates better into the anatomy. Um, and then after that, it's really about smear layer uh, removal and, and final rinse. So pr using something that is compatible with sodium hypochlorite that's going to remove smear layer and also provide uh, sustentivity. So a residual lasting kill of bacteria even after uh, irrigation is complete. John, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the product that the products that we have available for, for that? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously everybody kind of mentioned your, your kind of gold standard here against sodium hypochlorite and EDTA. I've kind of got the two things that I think, you know, really are what set us apart. It is that chlor extra, the enhanced sodium hypochlorite. And then what we have is smear off. So what's really cool about smear off is that it truly is a two in one. It's combining EDTA and chlorhexidine. There is no need to have to do a rinse between them. Yes, sodium hypochlorite does inactivate or they both kind of counteract each other. But what's really unique about smear off is that you don't need a rinse in between them. We've been able to engineer and design a chemistry that basically we have what we call kind of the scavenger in the, in the smear off product. The sodium hypochlorite goes after that and breaks down safely, leaving the chlorhexidine and the EDTA active. So there is no harmful precipitate that's formed um, and that you're able to do both the smear layer removal and also kind of your final rinse in one step. Um, what's really cool, again, we, we say it, we talk about it, but we've always been, as the irrigation leader, somebody that wants to test our products and get them validated outside. And we did this at the University of Toronto with Dr. Basrani. And it was about 15 back and forth. She even got some of their analytical chemists involved because a long time ago, she did a great paper, which shows that basically anytime you have chlorhexidine come in contact with sodium hypochlorite, you get what's called PCA. And so this is a harmful precipitate. It's something that you don't want to have happen. But with smear off, what's really cool about it is you do not have any PCA formation. And so she went as far, because she didn't believe us, to also 
put this in contact long-term with dentin because as everybody kind of knows, the one thing that's really cool about CHX is it binds and it stays to the dentin. This is what gives you that kind of long-term substantivity. And then she put sodium hypochlorite back in touch again with it, thinking she was gonna be able to form the PCA um, and she wasn't. And that's really because we have this unique uh, patented formula where we put a scavenger in there. That's what the sodium hypochlorite eats before it could even go and attack the CHX. So we've got a protected CHX that's still active. Um, it provides us with that cool kind of way to shorten your irrigation procedure. So we really say, you know, use your chlorextra or sodium hypochlorite followed by the smear up to get rid of that um, smear layer uh, and get rid of all that dent and mud. Yeah, that's pretty cool. The, is there a minimum contact time then because we combine the two? Um, so, you know, this is where it becomes a, a kind of a, a difficult thing. Um, ultimately, we do know that with about a one minute, that's typically what we like to have a one minute flush with smear up. That's what we're advocating. That allows to make sure that you've gotten all of the sodium hypochlorite out and that you're getting good contact with the smear up. And we did have a, a kind of a cool um, Q&A too, if, if anybody wants to hop on there. Nick, do you, there was a, a question about the end of ultra tips, if you can use it on a standard piezo. Okay, yeah, Dr. Adam Hardwood, if I, if I already have a piezo, can I use the tips for the endo ultra? Uh, no, unfortunately you can't. So the, the tips are designed to be used with the endo ultra only. The reason for that is it's, they're very delicate tips. They're size 2002. They're designed to really get you to the apical third and withstand ultrasonic energy. So they're really tuned for this device. Um, for that reason, to provide consistent cavitation every time. Um, whereas, you know, when you put a tip on a scaler that's really designed to cut dentin or, or scale or really operate really robust, thicker uh, tips, uh, you'll oftentimes get breakage, file separation in, in the apical third um, due to, you know, maybe not having the power dialed in. This is really nice just because it's always ready to go. Yeah, and then there's some other questions just overall. So if anybody can see, the tips are made of titanium, uh, not nickel titanium. Nickel titanium in ultrasonics breaks very, very quickly. So they asked just kind of how flexible it is. We can, how the endo ultra is done is that we provide the tips straight. The reason being is that you may want to change the bend angle slightly to depending on the, the case that you're at. So I thought that was a great question. Um, you can adjust it even more than what we have here. So you can change the bend angle and it still will be active. And then ultimately the tips are still very flexible this, despite being titanium. So one of the cool things about the endo ultra, I'm not sure if anybody can see that, um, is that you can truly, just like a file, pre-bend, I don't know if anybody's able to see that or not, pre-bend it to get access into the canal. And they're very, very flexible. So, I mean, ultimately I've kind of got like a, a large curly cue in this guy but you're able to do that and form it so you can get it into the canal and get access. Um, it's still very, very active. I always kind of use my, my fingernail as kind of the, the key if anybody can hear and see that, but uh, despite which way you bend it or kind of use it, it's still gonna be very active in the canal. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty good. Do we have any other questions in there that um, need answering? That looks like it's it. That's it, okay. Oh, there are a couple more that came in, actually. Uh, Dr. Ryan Gonick, is a timer built in? A timer is not built in, but we recommend that you activate for, for one minute per canal. And you'd want to do that with, with every solution. So, it, you know, your sodium hypochlorite, it's only going to uh, enhance the benefits of that. EDTA, it's been shown uh, to, to uh, enhance smear layer removal uh, by activating uh, with endo ultra for 60 seconds but a timer is not built in. All right. You know, um, oh yeah, good question is uh, why not use the uh, Clorox bleach from the, the store? And uh, maybe John, I'll let you ask that because you were talking about the, um, I guess the variability in the concentration of sodium hypochlorite. Do, have you guys tracked that? Do you know how it varies? It could be bottle to bottle or it could be over time, I believe, right? Yeah, correct. So ultimately, I mean, well, first problem, and this is kind of an interesting thing. We, we have seen that obviously with COVID, pretty much every place is stocked out. So 
if you're relying on Clorox and not getting it from, you know, kind of a, a dental manufacturer is that you do have disruptions in supply chain. Now, before this, I would say it's probably, it's around much more often, but that's also the problem is that it's sitting on the shelves for a very long period of time. And ultimately that's kind of what we were talking about is that you need to have about 3% active in order to do tissue dissolution. So as it sits in the, in the shelves and as it's sitting there, you really don't know what my concentration is. It's plenty to whiten your whites. It's plenty to bleach things that it's really intended for. But with us, we're testing every bottle. We have a very controlled thing. We actually have a walk-in cooler that we store all of our sodium hypochlorite in, and we test every single product before it's released. And we've got very good data on shelf life. We also stabilize our sodium hypochlorite better than the standard Clorox bleach. So that's really some of the, the quick notes, but you really want to make sure that you have a product that you know every time you're using it, it's fresh, it's active, it's at the optimal concentrations that you're, that you're really after, and that it's really meeting the spec that's labeled on the bottle. Yeah, I think that's all, all good. Um, I think, you know, when you're putting something in your body or somebody else's body, but it's something you just bought, you picked up off a shelf at the store, off the cleaning products, it kind of creates a little trepidation. What, what is the shelf life of the sodium hypochlorite that Vista has? Yeah, Nick, do you have that? Uh, it's 30 months. 30 months, all right. All right. Um, let's see, I'm just trying to see, because was, was this other... Um, Appropriate volume per canal. Um, John, do you guys have research that? Yes, yeah, so there's some pretty good, pretty good details on this. Ultimately, uh, it really depends on the irrigant uh, needle that you're using. So you really want to have a high flow rate, but not too high that you cause potentially an issue with apical extrusion. So we would recommend that you would use a side port needle, a closed end side port needle. Typically, that's going to be using, you know, for a molar case, you're going to be using more of like a 30 gauge needle to make sure you can get down uh, to the terminus. And what actually Dr. Hapasalo showed is that you really don't want to be using anything higher than about four milliliters a minute. And so ultimately, you'd want to be in the canal roughly for at least a minute as a final kind of irrigant. You're going to be wanting to use it as you pass files, what have you, uh, but at least a minute or two minutes inside each canal and be doing it about four mLs per minute. So that would be basically four to eight mLs per canal. Okay, that makes sense. No, thank you. I'm just trying to see. Uh, okay, good. Um, so we, we kind of left off, we were talking about the Smiroff and the EDTA and the chlorhexidine. Um, I don't know, did uh, I know Nick, you got some of the slides, you kind of showed them the op opening of the tubules and uh, did we discuss that enough? Yeah, I can uh, just touch on it a bit more. I think the importance of the solutions that we have, most everybody uh, that replied to the poll was using sodium hypochlorite and EDTA. So how is our system any different? How does it make life a little bit easier? Um, if you are, uh, I guess that it's really a one-two punch. Uh, it's sodium hypochlorite and then EDTA, but you're also getting the benefit of um, chlorhexidine. And you also don't have to rinse in between the two. As John was mentioning, uh, Smiroff's been formulated to not react with sodium hypochlorite. So it's really a one-two punch, sodium hypochlorite throughout instrumentation for debridement, Smiroff to remove smear layer, and then repeat that process once again as a final rinse uh, while incorporating activation. Yeah, and I think what Dr. Miyazaki is trying to get to too is you know, if you leave that dent and mud on the canals is that there's two major problems. One, you're leaving basically food for biofilm and bacteria to have and scavenge on. And then the second part of that is that you really are limiting your bonding and surface area. So despite what you've done to now open up the canal and clean it, you really obviously want to be able to obturate the best way possible. And I know there's a lot of kind of in the endodontic community and world of, do I remove the, the smear layer or not? If, if, you, if you're not too concerned about the bond strengths, which it, there's some data that says it could go either way, you certainly are leaving bacteria and residual tissue uh, that's left behind in, uh, inclusive of, yes, the inorganic portion, which is basically the hydroxyapatite that you've ground out. So really, you do want to be able to remove that smear layer, get out the remaining residual bacteria and anything else that the biofilm can thrive on. 
I think this is a cool image to just discuss what biofilm is. Maybe John, you can elaborate on this. I think my friend uh, showed me this image. You can think of planktonic bacteria as the free floating stuff, the stuff that's easy to wipe out. Uh, yeah, excellent. System. And I, I think the best kind of explanation and the way you can kind of think of just how difficult biofilm is, is I was just talking to Dr. Buchanan recently, and he said that he heard the best explanation of biofilm um, in, a, in a lecture. And basically, this person was describing biofilm as kind of like the rainforest, right? It's a very symbiotic thing. There's a ton of different uh, species that exist in it. And you really need basically um, a way to slash through all of that. So you've got the canopy, you've got the ground huggers, you've got everything clinging and, and just filling up the entire area. And it's multi-species. So once it becomes multi-species, it's very resistant. Um, you're getting that polysaccharide matrix, it's bonding onto the walls, and you really got to strip that stuff off. And so really that's the concern, right? Biofilm. And that's why you want to get rid of the smear layer. And then follow it back up, as Nick has, has talked about, with sodium hypochlorite. Um, the thing that I guess Dr. Dr. Buchanan always likes to talk about is he kind of raised his hand and said, that was my aha moment, right? This biofilm sounds terrible. So what do we have as doctors to kill it? And the, the presenters just kind of responded back, you've got it, it's sodium hypochlorite. It's, you know, it's the atomic bomb. So get that, strip away as much as you can, clean out the dent and mud, open up those tubules, and then come back in there with sodium hypochlorite, which is really, you know, your atomic bomb against biofilm. Yeah, you know, I think when we talk about irrigants, and I, again, I was, as I was mentioning at the start of the program, I've talked to different clinicians and some, um, you know, will use sterile water, sterile saline. Some will use uh, anesthetic solutions just to flush all that out. And it may be removing some of the, the uh, particulate debris that's been created from instrumentation, but yeah, there's no way that you kind of tame that biofilm and that, um, in, in that tropical forest, I guess. And uh, yeah. that, that's why I think a lot of, you know, we shape, we get down to the apex, everything looks perfect radiographically, and yet that tooth doesn't heal or it blows up on us. And I think a lot of it is that irrigation. Cool. Hey, Good Nick, point. there is a great Q&A. And I, 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 the only reason I keep kicking this back to you is I know you, more than anybody, have played around with the Endo Ultra. And so I don't know if you can answer that. Let's see. Let me go run over here and take a peek at it. Um, What's the breakage probability of sterilized once and used only on one four canal molar where three different solutions are energized for a minute each time for a total of 12 minutes? The breakage probability is, is highly unlikely. Uh, these tips are very robust, as John mentioned before. They're made of titanium, designed to be used over and over again. We recommend uh, that you dispose of the tip after 50 autoclave cycles. You'll see it's, you'll see, um, you know, the colors start to fade off of it. The blue color change to more of a silver color. That's really when we recommend um, replacing them. So I guess the answer is it's, they're really going to last you over and over again. Yeah. And I can tell you just, just so you guys know, it's basically the impossible thing. And I hate to say this, but when we were making the endo ultra, I was told I can't make it last too long, but I have to let it withstand, you know, 40,000 cycles per second, right? Super high shear forces and what have you, because we also are trying to make money on these things. And ultimately we, we were doing a lot of beta site testing and pretty much every single time people came back and said, I can't make them break. I we use them all the time. And I said, well, I did at least one thing. I made it so that it can't break easily, but we can't get a whole lot of replacement. So they are incredibly robust. Um, as Nick said, you will, the only thing you'll start to see instead of breakage, you'll see that the ultrasonic energy starts to diminish after about that 50 uses. So that's really why we're trying to tell you to replace it. Um, you're not going to see the breakage, but you will see the amplitude and the power output from that tip diminish over time. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I've had, I've had mine for quite a while and I, I have not had a, a tip break or, you know, worse yet, break well, it's being used. So yeah, my hat off, hats off to you for making it uh, so durable. <laughs> Thank you. So I know Nick, the, uh, the next question, maybe we'll let you hit, it's uh, from Dr. White, it's kind of more of a technique question. Yeah, I, so I've been placing the bleach in a canal using your endo activator for 20 seconds with a pumping motion. 
leaving the material alone for 60 seconds, repeat three times. Next, the EDTA with the same activation timing and finally a rinse of the bleach. You are saying leave the endoactivator in a canal for 60 full seconds only once, and then the same with the EDTA. Um, I, I think what you're, what Dr. White's doing sounds good. I've, I, I've um, ran into many different techniques when it comes to ultrasonic activation. We, we recommend 60 seconds per canal. I think this technique sounds pretty good though. Yeah, I think Dr. White brings up a great, great point though and we haven't really talked about it, absolutely you're gonna want to move the activator up and down throughout the canal. So 100% you're doing the right thing um, and moving it up and down. You kind of even saw it in that canal a block video that, you, that Nick showed, right? Is as you move it kind of back and forth, you're really energizing the whole system. And so that's really what you wanna do. You, do want, you don't wanna just be holding the activator, just you know, stationary in the canal. You really do wanna be using that pumping motion. Um, but yeah, you know, Honestly, the reason we don't have a beeper, and I'm just gonna tell this from the product development side, is we used to have it go for 60 seconds and nobody got to 60 seconds. So really, you know, that 20 seconds or 30 seconds, we advocate for a full minute, but we know, right, that, that takes a lot of time. We've shown that 30 seconds, 20 seconds, you get a ton of activation. We're just really kind of pushing it out there that, you know, if you really wanna to try to do your best, it's that apical third that's stubborn. We're really trying to push that out there. Um, but we know it's a long time to do in each canal. Yeah, and, and like John meant was, I, I think it's also important to mention that it's important to bring this pretty close to working length. You wanna bring it within three millimeters of working length. Really what that does then is it removes the vapor lock and really allows you know the apical third to get cleansed out really well. Um, got a couple more questions. Can it be dry claved rather than autoclaved for enhanced durability? John, you want to grab Yeah, that? so for us, um, it, it can be autoclave or sterilized with a dry clave as well. It's not going to change its performance. Titanium, that's the other beauty and the real reason why we chose it, is that ultrasonics provides a huge area uh, that's focalized on it that's very, very high heat because you're getting these standing nodes down the length of the file. So they're gonna be able to handle anything that you're throwing at it from 130 to 132 to 134 or dry or, or steam sterilization. It's not gonna change it, it's not gonna harm the, the file. Ultimately titanium can handle you know thousands of degrees and that's ultimately why it's used in spaceships and so on and so forth, but why it has to be used in ultrasonics. Another, another great question, some great questions coming in. So yeah, good. how are you keeping the irrigant replenished while activating the solutions? My chambers always get dry in 10 seconds or so. Um, I, it's really a constant replenishing of fresh irrigant. Uh, that's, that's really important. Um, so while you're activating, you'd be replenishing with, with fresh irrigant. Yeah, so there's, you know, the idea would be, right, you've got your syringe, um, while you're doing it, either if you can, try to do it two-handed where you're filling up the canal while you're using your activator. If you have the luxury of an assistant too, obviously that's what you'd be trying to do. Have them irrigate while you're activating as well. It's true. Yeah, uh, John, well, the next one, the sequence or uh, Nick, the sequence of solutions, what you found in your research. Oh, yeah. What's the recommended sequence of the solutions? There's controver controversies regarding this. I, I, I agree. I mean, there's a lot of uh, different protocols out there. What we recommend is, is really uh, the sodium hypochlorite or core extra and smear off and then repeat. Yeah, I'm assuming what Dr. Gannick is getting at is that this idea of exchange between sodium hypochlorite, EDTA, there's the controversy of this idea of erosion um, in that the moment you've done your EDTA, if you come back with sodium hypochlorite, the SEM show that there's erosion. Uh, first thing, number one, the damage has already been done when EDTA has been brought into the canal. The, AD, the EDTA, uh, and this is kind of what we talked about, how long do you want to use it? A minute is a long contact time. You really don't want to be using it much longer than that because it has such an impact on dent micro hardness. It is this very powerful chelator that pulls calcium right out of teeth. 
And so it's the biggest thing that can weaken the tooth, right? EDTA, once it's already been put in contact with dentin, has already done the, the harm. What we see is this erosion is that when you do the SEMs, the collagen's still left behind. So the SEMs look great, but the moment you touch it with sodium hypochlorite, you see this erosion. Well, the erosion was already there. And that's kind of this idea of this controversy. Uh, ultimately, you still want to have that exchange. And the last piece of that idea of kind of this erosion is that that erosion is, is very, very small. It's like the idea of passing a file one more time. We're talking about, you know, hundreds of, uh, not sorry, hundreds of microns, hundreds of nanometers that it's really eroding. It's so small um, that, that I think that's, and I hope that I answer that question in terms of the controversy, but you really do want the exchange. And again, uh, I would say Dr. Baumgartner has done some of the best research there showing that the only way to truly get rid of smear layer is to do the exchange. Gotcha. And then uh, Nick, there was an, uh, the, the question from Dr. Wang uh, and Dr. Gannick is there again. You guys yeah. want to handle this? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll start with also uh, Dr. Hordowitz, he asked if there's any specials on the endo-ultra and irrigants. There are some specials. Give us a call tomorrow. Anybody that participated tonight is uh, will receive 25% off endo-ultra and all the irrigants that were mentioned uh, in the program tonight. Um, regarding the neck, Dr. Wang, uh, what about using cold sterilization or even Clorox uh, for the endo-ultra tips? We really recommend uh, the autoclave. Um, you know, uh, John, do you have any thoughts on other? Yeah, you could certainly sterilize the tip in Clorox. There's nothing that's going to harm the tip. The titanium, the grade that we use is a medical grade surgical titanium, and it's completely compatible with sodium hypochlorite. So if, if that's something you'd want to do, absolutely. You could submerge it. It's not going to have any harmful effect on the end of ultra tips. Excellent. Hey, real quick, and then maybe we can uh, come back to Q and A's because uh, I know we're coming up on close to an hour. But I, I know for us as as general dentists doing root canals, uh, guys, there's a lot of setup. You know, we get the files, we have the ultrasonics, we have piezos for access. I mean, it's uh, in our office we have a whole tray, a cart that we kind of wheeled into the room. And then when it comes down to all these irrigants, like we were talking about, you know, there's, there's different uh, thoughts about the, uh, the sequence, the length of time. And then when my team has to set everything up, you know, they have to have a syringe for the sodium hypochlorite, the syringe for the EDTA, a syringe for the chlorhexidine. Sometimes I just want, uh, you know, water in a syringe just so I can do my rinsing. Um, what are you guys' thoughts on that? I know with, with the smear off, we've, we, we're down to, I guess, two syringes from three. Uh, what do you see in, is going to be the future of irrigation? Well, there's two quick things. I'm going to have Nick talk about the other one, but Vista did a long time ago offer, I've got it here. Um, it is what we call our canal clean kit. So interestingly about this, this is kind of a really nice product. If you're going to be doing kind of those people that answered that one to three or three to six a month, this comes prepackaged. It has all of the irrigants in it. So it comes with the, the Chlor Extra as well as the smear off. They're labeled one and two just to help kind of give you that. You want to use all the irrigants that's there throughout that procedure. Um, we provide you with the irrigant needle tips as well as an evacuator. We actually have another engineer here. He's a biomedical engineer that works in our R&D team. His wife is a GP. She loves this. This is a great way to kind of have everything prepackaged. You can place this on the tray and then you kind of, everything you're using when you're done, you're done. So for us, that's a definite convenience. That's something we're always trying to strive for, providing a nice, easy way to do endo. Um, and if you're doing, you know, less frequently, we'd highly recommend this. It's got everything you need. And then you can kind of, you know, if you're kind of knowing that you're one to three cases or three to six cases a month, that's the way you can kind of start to, to buy this and package it and so on and so forth. Um, but other than that, I know Nick definitely has a, a thing that we've been working on and he's ready to see it come commercialized. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So uh, like John mentioned, and I think the, the, the whole point of this uh, presentation was Vista is very passionate about standardizing uh, endodontic irrigation, uh, making outcome or predictable outcomes achievable to everybody uh, without really having to uh, put, put too much thought into what materials you're using and the, and the protocol. 
So one thing that we we're kicking around in, in development and will be available towards the end of the year is a, a irrigant that does everything. It achieves canal debridement, disinfection, smear layer removal, uh, combine, it provides lubrication for your instruments. Uh, so it's really just a simple uh, solution that takes some of the variability out of your protocol. Uh, John, John, you can go ahead and talk to it uh, uh, from a development standpoint, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. So it is something that has been, so, it's been a long passion of mine, right? We've, we've tried to enhance irrigants, we've tried to reduce procedural steps, but it's really difficult to replace what you're using right now. EDTA is a great smear layer removal product and sodium hypochlorite, as I mentioned before, is truly the best product you can have to do tissue dissolution as well as smear layer, uh, sorry, tissue dissolution as well as biofilm disruption. So the product we have is a sodium hypochlorite based product. And what we've been able to do is engineer another chelating agent that's compatible with that sodium hypochlorite. Um, the cool thing about this is I, I always kind of go back to this part in Billy Madison where he's trying to use shampoo and conditioner and people try to combine it and it just doesn't work, right? That's kind of the problem we've had in the development world is making sodium hypochlorite work with a chelator. Chelation really likes to happen at a lower pH, but you need a high pH to dissolve tissue and keep sodium hypochlorite stable. And so that's what's taken so long in the development world, but we have one single irrigant that replaces all prior irrigants. So you'd have one single uh, irrigant throughout your entire procedure. And we see that as a true game changer in endodontics to simplify irrigation and really take out that idea of, you know, what do I use, the sequence, switching back and forth, um, do I mix things wrong and I have a precipitate and all this other thing. So that's something we're really excited about. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, yeah, we have another polling question here about the convenience. So while we're filling that out, um, John and Nick, I mean, it, it almost sounds too good to be true that we take all three or against and we put it into one. Uh, is there any compromise that we see if we do that? So ultimately, the answer in the past was, was yeah, that's been the reason why we've been developing this product in about for the past five years. It's not been something that happened overnight. Um, we've optimized the pH so that it gives you comparable tissue dissolution to sodium hypochlorite that you'd be using. We've optimized the chelating agents that are in it, added surfactants, so on and so forth, to really give you the smear layer performance you're seeing. And just recently, we got um, biofilm studies back and we're showing that we're performing better than bleach. So that was kind of this last thing or by lowering pH and changing things, are we really sacrificing something? And what's really cool about, about Triton is the product's name what we're going for, is that by lowering the pH, this is kind of, it's, it's, a, it's actually a two component system. So that's how it's gonna be offered. We, we're gonna provide you with a real easy way uh, to fill bottle from to fill your syringes and then there's also a dual barrel syringe that you can use to do your irrigation. It's that it's it's right at the point of delivery. It's, it's active. It's good for a couple of hours and what we're showing now is that by kind of changing the pH, changing some of the things that we're doing is that we actually have more hypochlorous acid and that it's actually a more effective uh, irrigant than just standard bleach alone. Um, I know you were on the phone with Dr. Platino yesterday, Nick, or two days ago, and he kind of told you, but basically from a biofilm study, we're still seeing about two orders of magnitude more biofilm being, being there and active with just bleach. And we've taken it down to basically one single colony forming unit um, when we're using Triton. And so that's what's really gonna come into this idea of using it longer throughout the procedure, using it throughout instrumentation, using it as your final rinse. It's gonna really, that's what we're after, right? Is, is making it a better overall procedure, making it more predictable. So, so really you've taken everything and you put it, so just to kind of clarify, you, you said it's kind of, it's a two barrel type of delivery, but at the delivery point, it's just one needle that delivers yes. that. Yes, so correct. Simplified uh, three syringes to one delivery unit and the end result is everything that's been showing as far as research, research goes up to this point, that uh, everything is better and there's yes. no compromise. Yes, correct. Right, very cool. So you have definitely made things better and uh, more predictable and simplified. So you guys are hitting your objective. Yeah, that's, that's the cool. goal. Yeah, thank you. 
And I, I think I, I just looked at really quickly because uh, I got my screen off to the side, but the, uh, the results were that most everybody would be really interested in something that made endodontics easier and more predictable as far as the solution. So that was great to see. Um, you know, we're, kind of, we're coming up on that hour and uh, just want to say thank you again to everybody. Uh, the interaction, the Q&A portion worked out really well. We're glad that you asked the questions because we really want you to have the information you need, not just what, you know, what, what could have been presented. So we really appreciate the involvement of everybody that participated. I think now you understand why these guys, Nick Pond and John Baton, with their intelligence and figuring all this out, but I think also working with us as clinicians to figure out what products we actually need and which ones we actually value to have this to have more predictability. And I think one of the hardest things we do in dentistry, and that's an endodontic procedure, uh, these guys are there. Uh, I think one of the great things about working with a company like Vista Dental Materials is that if you have any questions after this program, you can pick up the phone and talk to these guys directly. And, and being that type of company, they're highly responsive. They can ask the, uh, answer the questions that you may have. And uh, I really thank you guys for you know, being on the program. Do you guys have any last words? Yeah, for me, just thank you, everybody. I hope you guys kind of take away that we're passionate about Endo. Um, we really are. And so we, we share your passion there. We're obviously not on the front line. Uh, so we love being able to talk to anybody and really appreciate the great questions today. Yeah, I just, yeah, I want to echo what John said. Definitely passionate about endodontic irrigation, and we're, we're here for you as customers. Uh, with that said, we want to do more of these programs, uh, educational type things with Dr. Mike. If there's anything, any topics that you'd like us to discuss more in depth, I know tonight was, was sort of uh, across the full system. We'd be happy to do that. So feel free to comment some suggestions, uh, and we'll work on developing that material in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So thank you to everybody. Uh, Nick and John, I really appreciate your time. And those of you that took the time to watch the program, either right now or hopefully in a recorded version, uh, please keep in touch. We're open to improving uh, everything that we do program-wise, product-wise, and uh, we really do want to listen to the customer and be responsive to uh, what our customers truly uh, value. So with that, I will sign us off and have a great day, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.